An active analog filter is shown designed here using four ideal op amps, op amp 1, 2, 3, and 4, with voltage being applied at this node, as you can see, with this being equal to cosine omega t, basically a sinusoidal input. Now we want to find the frequency response of this design and poles and zeros. Okay, so to do that quickly, let's make the assumption that op amps are properly biased, so all the positive negative supply voltages applied, negative feedback dominant for all the op amps, therefore circuit is in linear region of operation, we can assume virtual short is valid, so V positive equal to V negative for the voltages of the input terminals of each of the op amp. Now, you can see that V in is applied between this positive terminal of op amp 3 and ground, Therefore, because of virtual short, we can make the assumption V in is here as well. Now, V in being there, the interesting thing is as long as all the circuit op amps are in linear region of operation, you can see that this node, which is V in, is the same as this node, the same as this node, the same as this node, and the same as this node. So, as long as everything is in linear region of operation and virtual short valid, V in appears here as well. V in being there, this current can be computed, let's say it's current I. So I am going to compute current I, and uh, I am going to say current I is equal to uh, V in over R, because that's only voltage V in across a resistor R. Now, nothing can go through the input uh, terminal of ideal op amp, therefore we have this uh, current I flowing this way. Uh, because these two resistors are again um, the same value, and uh, on one side both of them have V in, like this V in and this V in, and on the other side you can see that they have a common node, so as a result what can be said is voltage drop across these two resistors should be the same. So I'm gonna just uh, write the voltage drop across these two guys is the same, there you go. So we have uh, plus minus, or any direction we want, plus minus, is the same as plus minus. So that current I, that current I is flowing, that current I is flowing upward through the resistor R, given that we make the assumption it's going this way. So um, there you go. As a result, I can say I is going through that resistor. Now, uh, what I can find is this current I cannot flow through the uh, wire going to the left side because that wire is flowing through the input terminals of op amp and input terminals of ideal op amp has, um, have a, a infinite impedance so no, no current can flow that way. So this current I has to continue going upward and goes through the cap and result in a voltage drop across cap. So I can say the voltage drop across cap C1 is current I times impedance of C1 which is 1 over C1s. So as a result using equation 1 I can just say the voltage across cap C1 with the polarity that I have shown here, so this polarity, is equal to V in, I'm substituting for I using equation 1, so V in over R C1s. Okay, so that's the voltage across cap C1. With the same, so <clears throat> for the same reasoning as I mentioned before, you can see that on... Um, on one side of C1, we have this node, which is V in, and also on one side of R, we have this node, which is also V in. So voltage on um, one side of R and C1 is the same. On the other side, they have a common node. So therefore, as a result, voltage drop across R should be the same as voltage drop across uh, C1. So uh, I can say VR should be equal to VC1. What is the benefit of that? I can find this current. Let's name that current as current I. Now let me use a different color so that you can see it better. So um, that current is what I refer to as current I2. And I2 has to flow this way because it cannot come from the input uh, terminal of ideal op amp that has infinite impedance. No, no current can flow in, in or out. So that I2 is obviously just Vr divided by, for this resistor, divided by its value, R. So as a result, I can find it by just substituting from equation 2. So this is 2. I can just result from equation 2, substitute for Vr, and as a result, I have Vn 
over r square c1 s. Okay, so let's have this as uh, important equation number three, which defines i2 as a function of v. All right, um, so this i2 cannot again flow through the uh, or through or out, out of the input terminal of op amp, so i2 has to come from flowing through the resistor R as shown here. So therefore I can find Vx here. So let's find it. Vx is equal to um, voltage drop across this resistor, which means Ri2 plus voltage at this node, which is obviously Vn. Okay, substituting from equation uh, 3 for I2, I can say Vx is equal to um, as you can see, become R divided by R square C1S, and I2 is effectively V in. Uh, and what, what we have is plus V in as well. So let's factor V in and cancel out uh, R with R square in denominator. So V in times uh, 1 over R C1S. So 1 over R C1S plus 1. Okay, so what is this? Let's name this equation number, let's name this, we found Vx as a function of Vn, as a function of Vn. Let's name this equation number four. Okay, uh, one interesting observation when you look at the I2 as seen here, as a function of Vn as applied, so this is Vn is from perspective of this node, as if given that the relationship between V in with the voltage applied at that node and the current that is coming out of that node, uh, it seems as if, or it feels as if we have emulated or basically we have realized a sort of a virtual inductance there using a impedance converter uh, because of R, R square C bond S that we see in denominator as if there is a inductance there, which we don't have it actually. So it's as if, it sort of feel as if there is an inductor here going to ground, um, and that's interesting. All right, and now let's go back to analyzing the circuit. Um, in this case, what we have is we are at Vx, and uh, we, keep, we keep going on. So what we can find is because of virtual short, when this node has zero volt, as long as the circuit is linear operation, this node also has zero volt here, and no current can flow. Um, so as a result, as a result, we can write uh, a simple uh, KCL or Kirchhoff current law. All the current that is flowing here should continue going uh, toward KR, a potentiometer. So this potentiometer or variable resistor, whatever current IX is flowing from RC2 should continue to KR. So I can write a KCL um, at negative, uh, let's say input terminal of op amp 4, input terminal of op amp 4, and uh, op amp 4, and that means I have to write Vx divided by R plus 1 over C2S, which is the impedance of, which is the in impedance of these R and C2 in series, uh, should be equal to the voltage drop across the, sorry, should be equal to the current that is going through KR. And the current through KR is obviously zero, which is this voltage, minus V out, divided by KR. What I'm trying to do is, rather than just writing a formula for an inverting amplifier, which uh, effectively what op amp 4 is doing here, it's an inverting amplifier scenario in which you can say Vx come in, there is an impedance, and then there is an op amp that, that is, we are assuming it's in linear region of operation with this formation, and there is a KR resistor here, and going to, um, and there is a KR resistor here, and it's going to output V out. So this is obviously an inverting amplification, so an inverting amplifier scenario, uh, but I'm not going to use just the quickly the formula for the gain. Uh, what I'm going to do is just I'm going to write the KCL and effectively doing this, uh, what you expect to see from a, uh, showing you what you expect to see from an inverting amplifier scenario. Okay, 
So what happens is, if I continue this, I get v out over vx is equal to, um, or I can just say v out is equal to, v out is equal to negative kr over r plus 1 over c2s vx. So let's name this equation number 5. And we are almost done. Now, combining 4 and 5, I can substitute for vx using 4, which in which I defined vx already. So I would say use 4 and 5. So using 4 and 5, I get v out is equal to uh, minus kr. And then I have, so let me put it this way. So minus kr times um, what I get is, just to make sure I'm not missing something. OK, so um, what I get is minus kr and then um, C2s divide by uh, R C1s times Uh, times it's going to be just to make sure I'm not missing something one plus times one plus R C one S divide by one plus R C two S okay that's exactly what I wanted to find times V so it's divide V in. This is basically the transfer function of the system. V out over V in is equal to this outcome. If you simplify it, which it means we get rid of R and R here. So uh, let's remove R and R. So this R goes away with this R. S goes away with this S. Basically what we get is negative K C2 over C1 times um, just this interesting transfer function. So as a result, what we can see is in this uh, transfer function, we have one zero coming from this guy. Um, so that would have the zero and one pole coming from this one. So if you want to find the poles and zeros, you would say, okay, so um, zero of the transfer function, of the transfer function is just by setting numerator polynomials, first order polynomial in numerator to, z, uh, to zero. And then by doing that, we find the S or Z, however you want to name it, um, equal to, let me put it this way. So you would say S equal to negative one over um, RC1. And for the pole of the transfer function, do the same thing, set the first order denominator polynomial a 1 plus R C2 S to 0 and then find uh, the S which becomes minus 1 over R C2. Okay, so these are the poles and zeros of uh, the transfer function for this filter. Interestingly, when S goes to 0, you can see that when S goes to 0, which means so at super low frequency, let's say at DC, near DC, you're saying omega approaches um, omega or s approaches zero. Okay, so I put it this way: omega goes to zero, s goes to zero, and therefore the whole transfer function, uh, according to this uh, computation with it here, turns into just minus k. So in that case, v over v in just converges to minus k uh, c two over c one. There are also, uh, the, of course, there are some complications here because uh, at DC, you would argue that C2 cap is uh, open and therefore circuit is seemingly disconnected from output. But at the same time, you could argue that the, um, assuming so, as long as the circuit remains in a linear region of operation, you could argue that the existence of this inductor tries to counteract the effect of disconnection via C2. And uh, that's exactly what we see in terms of having a uh, counteracting uh, uh, first-order polynomial in numerator versus uh, first-order polynomial in denominator. 
So circuit has practical limitations, of course. So, but, but theoretically speaking, this is what we are observing asymptotically and at super high frequencies uh, when omega goes to infinity or basically when s goes to infinity then uh, of course the because of the shape that we have for the transfer function uh, it just converges to rc 1s divided by rc 2s and then as a result of that you can see that the circuit converges again to gain of vo over v in um, just um, as simple as k minus k. That's it at super high frequency. So it looks like the circuit is uh, both uh, passing low pass uh, f frequencies and high pass, let's say low, low component frequencies or close to DC. So basically it looks like a LPF. At the same time, it's also passing a high frequency components so um, a high pass filter. In the mid frequencies, everything will depend on the ratio of C1, C2 meaning that whether C1 is happening sooner or C2 is happening, uh, whether RC1 is happening sooner in terms of the zero or the pole is happening sooner. So you would argue that the frequency response, um, again, just concept of the frequency response. If we show, uh, let's see, if we have this frequency response and I am showing as a function of omega in radian per second, and this is absolute value of transfer function which means absolute value of v out over v in. So absolute value of v out over v in as a function of frequency, which we refer to as, uh, let's say, 20 log of that. So usually what we do is we refer to body plot 20 log 10 v out over v in as a function of omega. Um, so that, that is effectively the body magnitude plot and in that case we can see that based on this conversation or based on this observation asymptotically we have we have a, a sort of a constant at uh, um, say um, whatever value it is it depends on c2 over c1 so we have a constant and then let's say if uh, zero happens sooner um, so at some point we are starting to see 20 db per decade increase um, near the let's say I'm making it up near the zero location or uh, position. And then at some point we will hit the position of pole and that would uh, cancel out the effect of zero. And uh, it would turn out to be afterwards something like this. Uh, in reality, it will be a frequency response that is looking like, in this case, it's more of a this sort of a behavior asymptotically again. As, as long as the circuit is sort of a stable. So you will have this behavior. Or if you set the value of K, the potentiometer, and also set the value of C1, C2 in another way. Uh, so the potentiometer K actually just um, define the gain of the system. As you can see, K is affecting the gain like that. But if you set the K C1, C2 ratio, especially C1, C2, then maybe you end up with a scenario that looks more of a this outcome. So uh, in, if pole happened first, then you would start from the beginning. And then because pole happens first, so that's zero. But if poles ha pole is the one that happens first, you would start seeing the 20 dB per decade drop. And then at the moment that you hit zero, uh, it, in this scenario, I'm assuming zero is at, at high frequency compared to pole because of just the way C1, C2 is set up. Now we get flatting zone. And uh, basically, the response of a filter in reality would be more of a this sort of a response. I hope that this is helpful in terms of uh, analyzing, uh, showing an example of anal analysis of a, an analog filter and uh, active analog filter. And then the fact that we can uh, sort of uh, virtually realize a inductance. And then in this kind of circuit, uh, how you find the transfer function and poles and zeros and based on the parameters of the circuit in this case value of c1 c2 and uh, k how you can and r of course how you can find the frequency response in terms of magnitude body plot which is the main focus here you're not discussing uh, phase uh, plot but uh, then depending on c1 and c2 you can see that um, we can uh, define or or shape the uh, the format uh, of the magnitude body plot.
I hope that this is helpful.